All right, so today we are in Sin, A Breach of Relationship, Part 4. Cheer for sin. It's weird. Okay, yay. <laughs> well, we're not cheering for sin. We're cheering for understanding it so it doesn't trip us up. Okay? All right. Yes, I did say some of you were tripping. All right, so it's an 80s thing. I'm sorry. Okay. So let's just redefine our terms here. I don't know. I, mercy, I look at you and I'm right, we're back in the 80s. You know, Brooklyn Tech versus, you know, Stuyvesant, and we've just got this thing going. Okay. The, um, okay, so the launching point here, just remind us, so sin is what? It's the missing of the mark in a relationship. So basically, when you miss the mark, it creates, often enough, a breach. Okay? So what's the breach? An expectation that wasn't met, or an expectation that you wouldn't do something, you did something that you shouldn't have done. So there's a breach of expectation. All right? Now... When it's against Elohim, you have to understand, of course, that he sets the expectations we don't. But he also tells us what we can expect from him, and he tells us what, we, what he expects from us. And so that's where the normal definition of sin would come in. The standard one is doing something that falls short of or breaches relationship with our creator. Of course, we could do the same thing with everybody, okay? If you have a relationship, it doesn't matter, husband, wife, parent and child, employer and employee, friends, coworkers, anything, if you have a relationship with some you know, certain expectations, those expectations can get stepped on, trespassed or breached, and it will damage the relationship, okay? It will cause damage to the relationship. Now, let's go ahead and now look at, we're going to bring Yeshua into this, and we're going to start in Matthew chapter 1. One person said, yay. Okay, so Matthew chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 18, okay? Well, actually, let's begin in 21, and then we'll go back to 18 for context. Okay, it says, And she shall give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Ah. Now, and the word save there, I think, is better translated deliver, okay? Deliver from their sins. Because deliver out of the bondage of sin, deliver out of the penalty of sin. It's more of a deliverance. And the idea of salvation really trips people up and confuses them because it seems like that's a reward of some sort. It, 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 like somehow salvation equals eternal life and all this other stuff. Now, without it, you can't have eternal life. But just understand, go listen to the Are You Saved teaching. It'll be clear as mud. Okay, now, so that being said, let's look at 18. The birth of Yeshua Messiah was as follows. After his mother Miriam was engaged to Yosef, before they came together, so they had not been intimate yet, she was found to be pregnant from the set-apart spirit. And Yosef, her husband, being righteous and not wanting to make a show of her, had in mind to put her away secretly. But while he thought about this, see, a messenger of, of Yahweh appeared to him in a dream, saying, Yosef, son of David, do not be afraid to take Miriam as your wife, for that which is in her was brought forth from the Holy Spirit, from the set apart spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. And she shall give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall deliver his people from their sins. All right, now that being said, actually we'll, we'll continue from there in a minute. Let's go back. So here's Miriam. She is found to be pregnant. They had not been intimate yet. So then there's this thing called putting away that's being considered by Yosef in verse 19. You need to listen to the teaching called divorce, remarriage, and putting away to understand the difference between divorcing and putting away. It's very, very, very important. It may set you free from a lot of bondage and torture because you thought that you were doing something that would be in sin when you weren't, okay? So let's understand that. Now, that being said, he being righteous. I'm thinking righteous is not just doing everything by the letter, but it's the fullness of the spirit, of the fruit of the spirit. He wanted to be kind and loving and gentle, etc. He did not want to do what putting away normally would do. Putting away was like putting a scarlet letter on them. Okay, they were marked publicly, not physically marked, but they were marked, called out publicly as having done Something like getting pregnant when you're engaged and married, right? Getting pregnant and it's not your husband. And so this would have been a very public thing to do, warning everybody, you don't want to do this yourself because you'll get publicly shamed. Also letting everybody know this woman is no longer marriageable. That's the punishment. 
The husband would then be free to do whatever he wanted, to go ahead and marry again. Not whatever he wanted, but you know, to go ahead and marry him. But the, the wife was now publicly a leper, basically. Okay, she was just not. Now, he did not want to do this to Miriam. Okay? He did not want to put her to shame. He also knew he couldn't marry her. So he didn't know what to do. So he was put in this very challenging position. And so then the messenger comes and tells him, no, 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 this is fine. She didn't cheat on you. She didn't go ahead and commit adultery. She didn't do any of those things. And so he says, you could go ahead and you can marry her. And now it says in verse, so then it says in verse 21, and you're going to call his name Yeshua, which in Hebrew literally means deliverance or salvation. You're going to give him that name because he's going to deliver his people from their breach of relationship. Okay? See, read this correctly. And we're going to get into some, to some of the verses that are also in the Discover Your Identity teaching to show you how this makes so much more sense. Because we think about he's going to give them you know, he's going to save them from their sins, meaning somehow he's just going to wipe them out or something, et cetera, et cetera. It's so much more than that. He's going to deliver you out of the body of sin. He's going to deliver you out of the, the, uh, the path that was serving sin. He's going to either serve sin or you're going to serve the Father and to righteousness. You're not going to, you can't serve nobody. You're serving one or the other, right? Now, he's also going to deliver you from the penalty. Because sin, we, as we know it, the penalty of sin is what? Death. Okay, the fruit of sin, the reaping and sowing of sin is death. So now, you come very, get to verse 22. And this all came to be in order to fill what was spoken by Yahweh through the prophet saying, what prophet? Isaiah, correctly. Okay, correctly stated. All right, so in Isaiah it says, see, a maiden shall conceive and shall give birth to a son. And the reason it says maiden there instead of virgin there because it's not that she wasn't. It's just that the Hebrew for virgin might have been a different word more frequently, but certainly this was a young woman that would not have had that relationship, okay? It's just the word that they chose. But she's going to conceive and give birth to a son, and you're going to call his name Emmanuel, which is translated means El with us. Okay, wait a minute. He just told them to call him Yeshua. Isaiah said you're going to call him Emmanuel. Do we have a problem here? No. Well, why not? Well, first of all, Isaiah was being told this, I believe it's in chapter 7, because there was going to be a birth, and it was actually his wife giving birth to a son who was named Emmanuel. And you read that in chapter 8. Okay, because everything that was happening was type and shadow. So that prophecy that Isaiah was giving was absolutely not about this. It absolutely was about this, if you understand what I'm saying. Because Isaiah was not only talking about this. He was talking about something because King Ahaz was freaking out that they were going to get destroyed you know, by these different nations coming about after them. And he said, no, 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 no. As a sign that you're not going to get destroyed, I'm going to give you this baby in a miraculous form, and that baby is going to be named Emmanuel so that you know that God is with you always. Elohim is with you. So every time you see that baby, you stop panicking. All of us should be the same way. Every time we see Yeshua, not literally, but every time we see Yeshua, we should not be panicking. Okay, he is with you. So that'll be with you to the end of the age, right? He'll be with you. Now, so when we understand the role here is to deliver the people from their sins, and sin is a breach of relationship. So when the prophecy was that he will be called Emmanuel or El is with us, well, that's not possible because what do we know that sin does? It separates us from him, right? It separates you from your creator. So this is the path to restoration of the breach. Ooh, that's cool. Yeshua is the restoration path. Not, he doesn't just restore it. He's the path to restoration. He makes it possible to make restoration. Go listen to the teaching forgiveness, restoration, recon you know, reconciliation. They're not three this, parts of the same thing, okay? They're three different things. The forgiveness part is necessary for the other two, but if you forgive, you're not required to do the other two. They may not even be possible. Father always forgives you. To be reconciled, you need the path. To be restored in the breach, you need the path. Yeshua says, I am the path. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the path. All right, now, and that is to remind us that through him, El is with you now. You were separated. 
So yes, we refer to him as El is with us. But not so much the way Christianity always taught it, actually not so much the way I always taught it, where he being El was with us in the flesh. While that's still true, I think it's also, he's there to show us that L is with us. L is with us. Because the breach can be bridged. That's, it could, there, there could be a restoring of the breach. Which is a phrase that, or a concept that Abba loves to use throughout Scripture. It's the idea of finding those that would restore the breach. Of course, in the prophets, he says he looked for someone to do that and couldn't find anybody. Which is pretty disturbing. Now, so we have that going on here. So, Yeshua will save his people from the penalty of breaching relationship by missing the mark of Yahweh's expectations through covenant. Right? We have a breach because we didn't meet the expectations through covenant. Exodus 19, you agree to do everything I say. They said yes. That's where the breach came when they didn't do everything he said. His people were and still are suffering the consequences of this relationship breach. Now, by the way, I want to... I'm not, okay, I said this last night, I want to say it again here on the stream as part of this teaching. This ministry is different. <laughs> I know you're shocked. This ministry is different. And what I mean by that is my position to you is a little bit different. I'm not just a talking head or administrator putting a congregation together. Okay, we are part of a body. Now, that's the way everybody's always thought of the body, is that interchangeable heads can be plugged in, teach a little bit, run the day-to-day the -day operations of, a, of a, an assembly, and that's all that guy's for, maybe counseling a little bit. No, my, my role is like Moses' role. I'm not saying I'm Moses, like his role. What was his role? To get them to the land safely, okay? And he corrected them when necessary. He encouraged them when necessary. He's, he stood in the breach when necessary. And so I'm going to encourage you to understand those of you who claim you're covenanted and you're breaking and disobeying things that you never do, that you're supposed to do, stop claiming covenant. If you're breaking Sabbath every week or every month, stop claiming covenant. If you're not tithing, stop claiming covenant. If you're eating wrong, stop claiming covenant. If you're not keeping every single feast, not some of them, all of them, then you're not in covenant. Anything breaks covenant, any one of those things, right? You don't need to break a whole bunch of them to claim, well, I'm in covenant, kind of, sort of, whatever. No, you're either in or you're out. Okay? So, so just stop that. Well, don't you tell me I'm not in covenant. I'm telling you you're not in covenant. If you meet those criteria. So stop playing at this or trying to justify doing it your way. Because that's, look, you know, none of you are Frank Sinatra. You're not singing my way, okay? Because you're going to say I did it my way, and Yahweh's going to say, and you can do that over there in the line that's going in the fire. Amen. The line starts right over there. You can have a, have a seat, okay? You don't get to do this your way. You got to do it his way. Yeshua says you got to seek that which is well-pleasing in the sight. Well, actually, one of the apostles said about Yeshua, seek what's well-pleasing in the sight of the master. Okay, I think Paul said that. And so, let's understand. And actually, Yeshua said things very similarly. He's restoring a breach. Okay, so don't think, this is again, that Christianity little thing. That, you know, if you haven't removed every little tendril of that mindset, it will metastasize like a cancer. And you'll be thinking that way all over again. Uh, we know a whole bunch of people, not too far down the road, doing exactly that. Okay, sounding more and more Christian every day. Behaving more and more Christian every day. And I'm not against Christians. The system they're in has lied to them. The system, they think they're doing everything right, as you did when you were there. But now that you're here, that, fills, that fits into the metaphor of going back to your vomit. <gasps> Rabbi, how dare you accuse them of being vomit? Is what it is. Okay? Because that's not going to get you where you want to go. It's going to keep you always in sin. You'll always, in some, you'll always be in some level of breach. Okay, and you need to get that figured out. I don't want you to be in breach, in sin of that relationship. So don't tell me, well, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years. Have you been doing this for 10 years? What are you doing? Are you, some of the men are telling me this. They're not even circumcised. And you're telling me you're doing this. 
You still work on Saturdays or holy days, and you still say, tell me, well, I'm doing this. You still haven't figured out this, that, or the other thing and gotten it right. I'm not picking on the things you don't know. Remember, he said that which is revealed belongs to you. He's revealed a lot of things to you. If you're not doing it, you're responsible. You're going to be held accountable. So let's just understand that. Yeshua will save his people. Big quote unquote, his people. Not all people, his people. Now, he provided the opportunity for all to become his people. But those that will actually be saved will be those that fall into the category of his people. What determines that? You. Your choice to be his people. What does he say in John, I think in 15? Stay in me. See, it's your choice. Because you can leave. Oh, but no, it says, Yeshua said to the Father, I've not lost a single one out of my hand. No, he didn't lose any of you. Some of you climbed out. Or jumped out. Flew out. But he didn't lose you. He didn't drop you. He didn't like put you somewhere and forget, oh, where did, where did that guy go? I lost him. But you, you have to take this seriously. Look, I, I don't know if they do this still today in school, but the kingdom exam is not going to be graded on a curve. All right? See, some of you know what I mean. Okay? It's not being graded on a curve. It's a straightforward test. Everybody's going to get the score that they're going to get. Okay? There's no curve. Now, that's very important that we get that. Yeshua will call, guide, and lead into a relationship with him and the Father those who will hear, know, have a relationship, know and do the expectations of the covenant. And he will inspire them to walk them out doing what hits the mark. That's his role. I am the truth. I am the way. I am life. He says, you know, he's a walking, talking Torah. We've said this so many times. So how do you restore relationship? You embrace Yeshua. All of him, light, truth, Torah, etc. That breaches, that fills the breach. It, it fixes the breach. When you start doing this part, you're called and led into the relationship. Remember he said, none comes unless the Father draws, none comes the Father unless I draw, basically, okay? All right, so that part's done. He's already popped your bubble. That part is finished. You, you've already been drawn and called. Okay, but now it's those who will hear and own, like have the relationship with and, th and do what's in the covenant the expectations of the covenant that are going to be delivered. Okay, now he's going to inspire you, encourage you, and be there, you know, when you mess up and you repent and you turn around and hopefully clean yourself off and then you get up again and go. But just understand that this is literally what it's talking about. Not whatever nonsense you heard your whole life. This is what it's saying. And so let's not mess around with it. Okay? It's very important that we get this. Now, continuing here. So, uh, verse 24, and Yosef... Awaking from his sleep, did as the measure of Yahweh commanded him and took his wife and knew her not until she gave birth to her son, the firstborn, and he called his name Yeshua. All right, good, awesome. Now, let's go to Luke 19. Now, take that, I'm, I just laid a foundation for where we're going here. Luke 19. Now, this is something that's also covered in the Discovering Identity. So, Luke 19, and we're going to go to... Verse 10, but then I'm going to go set, I'll get the whole setup of it afterwards. So what we're going to clarify is in verse 10, it says, for the son of Adam has come to seek and to save what was lost. Anybody know that verse? Every church teaches that verse, right? We're here to seek to save the lost, but they have no idea what this is referring to. They really don't. As a matter of fact, they got it all inside out and backwards. Shocking, I know. Okay, let's start in verse 1 and understand what this is talking about. And actually, you should already know from what I just read you in Matthew. He says, and having entered, verse 1, he was passing through Jericho and see a man called Zakai, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see Yeshua, uh, see who Yeshua was, but was unable to, because the crowd was so big, right, for he was a, a small stature. So having run ahead, he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him because he was about to pass by. And as Yeshua came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zakai, hurry and come down, for I have to stay at your house today. How, first of all, I think we could miss how cool that was. He came by, he knew the man's heart, knew what he wanted, knew the guy's name, and said, 
I have to stay at your house today. But also, you know how when he healed that one person, he said, no, it wasn't because he was sinned or his mother sinned. It was because I was going to do this miracle because of what's about to happen next is what this is all about. He says, and having seen it, they all grumbled saying, he has gone in to stay with the one who is a sinner. But Zakai stood up and said to the master, look, master, I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have taken whatever from anyone by false accusation, I repay fourfold, which is more than Torah requires. And Yeshua said to him, today deliverance has come to this house since he is also a son of Avraham. For the son of Adam has come to seek and save what was lost, lost sons of Avraham. Is it really that hard to figure this out? I mean, did I have to go really deep to get you to see that connection? So this person was seen to be in breach of relationship. And he said, no. He says, deliverance from, all, from that breach is that, because you are now showing your heart has been, is whatever it, what it was before, it's now right. So you're approaching things correctly. You're making the efforts. I can work with you now, basically. The breach needs to be fixed so he can work with you. Can't work with you when you're in a breach. So a breach doesn't fix everything. Now he can work with you, though. He says, no, this man's heart is right. I can work with him. I don't want people to think, oh, he was, he was saved. Because that's what church will tell you. He's, he was saved on that day. No, he found out that he could be delivered on that day. He was delivered out of the noise, the nonsense, of the guilt of thinking, well, I'm a tax collector and I'm rich. I'm never going to be accepted by anybody. And Yeshua just told everybody to sit down and shut up. <laughs> this man is delivered. Because I came to seek what was lost. Now, I know this is hard. But see, I have a pen. Okay, this pen right here. And if I left it somewhere and I'm seeking what I lost, I'm seeking something that was mine to begin with. I had to pick a blue pen that blends into the background so you can't even see it. All right, okay? So Yeshua didn't, see the church wants to define the lost as anybody not Christian, right? Is that, do I have the definition wrong? Okay, that's it, right? No, Yeshua was talking about anybody of Israel or even children of Avraham. He says, they, or who I'm seeking because I lost them or they jumped out of my hand, so to speak. Okay, that's why I gave that analogy first. I'm here to seek them, okay? And so it's not just going to, it's like I once was lost, but now I'm found, like this pen, right? So lost and found. So, but it, it, you have to have had it to begin with. <laughs> okay, you can't lose something that was never yours and you never had it. Man, I don't know what I did with my Jaguar. Well, I never had one. No, I'm sure I lost it. I, I, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so keep that in mind. It's also in the Discovering Your Identity teaching. But Yeshua says this, that, and by the way, we're going to read another verse. This is the reason he's here. He's here to do this, right? He said, I have come, the Son of Adam has come to seek and save what was lost. This is critical that we get this. So those that were in covenant or in relationship and then had a breach, which means they were sinners. Because remember, this guy was called a sinner. The crowd called him a sinner. And he probably was in breach at some point. And Yeshua, Yeshua said, but he's trying to get it right. I can work with him now. He doesn't know what to do. He's giving more than he needs to and do this other stuff. But he's trying to do what's right. And he looked for me. See, that's the key. What is the way to rest restoration and reconciliation? Yeshua, the Torah, the way, the path. He was seeking that. He wasn't seeking a wave of the hand and said, okay, you're good, you're saved, go on with your life. He wanted to know how to be in covenant and not in breach of covenant. That's what you all should want. That's, why you should, that's the reason you should be here is to learn how to be in and not in breach of the covenant. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 5. Okay? We'll stay here in Luke. Chapter 5, and verse 29. Verse 29. We're dealing with a similar thing. Okay, and Levi made a great feast for him in the house, and there was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled against this tall one, saying, why do you eat with drink and drink with tax collectors and sinners? 
What are you busybodies hanging around watching him to know where he's going anyway? I have a neighbor like that. Okay, so don't, doesn't everybody have a neighbor like that? Um, okay, verse, verse 31. He says, and Yeshua answering said to them, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but those in breach. Not those who are just anybody. He talked to only Jews initially, right? Actually, he only talked to Jews all the way through. But the point was to start with them first. Paul says of the Jew first, not of the Jew only. He said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, so Christians say, see, he came for the Gentiles. No. He's looking for those that are in breach, who are not Gentiles, those who are of covenant. He said, um, now key, key here is the last word, repentance. I came to call them to repentance, not to salvation, not to all that, because repentance leads to all that. See, the attitude of the one in chapter 19 was one of contrition, of repentance, of wanting to be right, just not knowing what to do necessarily. So here is the same kind of thing. He says, look, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, but I claim to call them to repentance. What is repentance? Owning what you did, knowing you shouldn't have done it, committing not to do it again, wishing you hadn't done it, re repairing the, like if there's something you could do to restore the situation to do that and then moving forward in the right way. And they said to him, well, why do you tell ones? Okay, I don't think I wanted to go that far. Verse, I only wanted to go to verse 39. So I didn't want to go there. All right, he says, why do you tell ones of Yochanan fast often to make prayers and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? He's like, they're all being so pious and your guys are partying. Not literally, but that's what it looked like to them, right? And he said to them, are you able to make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? Why would you be fasting when it's, it's a time to rejoice? He said, but days shall come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they shall fast in those days. So she was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. So he would not physically be with them. And he also spoke a parable to them saying, no one puts a, a, piece, of fre uh, a piece from a fresh garment on an old one, otherwise a fresh one makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the fresh one does not match the old one. So you notice what he did here? He ignored them. Because he's continuing, if you took that little piece out with what he was originally saying. They interrupted the flow. He was trying to talk about that which was lost and, and the, the problem with understanding that there has to be a repentance and a change. And they said, hey, how come you guys party? And the rest of you? He said, okay, I'll answer your question, but you're interrupting, shut up. <laughs> what was that, five, six? Oh, that was okay. Um, but that's really, you notice he goes right back to it. Because this, this doesn't have anything to do with the bridegroom at this point. This has to do with what he was saying before. He says, look, you can't take uh, and put a fresh piece of garment on an old one because the fresh one will make a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the fresh one does not match the old. The piece of the new one doesn't match the old. The piece of, the, I'm not talking about New Testament old, I'm talking about, well, actually, Christianity teaches that way, it doesn't match the old, which actually shows you why that can't be. He just said it in this parable. Probably never said that before, and you probably never heard that before. Think of it. But you, okay, as you come to become more and more Yeshua like, the, it won't match the old you. You can't put a patch on the old you. You need to bury the old you and be a new you, okay? He says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine shall burst the wineskins and run out, and the wineskins shall be ruined. Okay, because the new wine is much more effervescent, it's much more bubbly, there's a lot more stuff going on in there, right? Through the fermentation process and all that. So it's gonna burst the skin. Well, guess what? What you're learning is very bubbly, and it's gonna burst the skin if you're putting it in an old wineskin. And some of you explode and crash and go back to whatever because you just can't handle it. You can't handle it. You get all excited, you take in all of that good new wine, and then it, it, you're putting it in old wineskin. And so it doesn't go well. Okay, something's got to give. He says, otherwise the new wine shall burst the wineskins and run out, and the wineskins shall be ruined. He says, now, but new wine is put in fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. Hmm. No one 
Now, what, why is he saying all this? Part of it is because of what they said both times. The two things that the, the Pharisees and the scribes are saying. He said, you guys have to think differently. You have to change what you've understood. Well, this man's a sinner and we can't eat with him. No, you're missing the point. No, you don't participate with them, but they need me here because they're, they're asking me questions and I'm helping them and I'm leading them out of here. Oh, well, Rabbi, that's why I still go to Sunday church. No, that's not why you go. Because you're not leading anybody, nobody's seeking you for anything outside of whatever they're already doing. Because if they did, you've been thrown out. Okay, because that isn't happening. And this is Yeshua saying, I came because the sick need the doctor. And so these people are in breach, they need to learn how to fix the breach. And I am the way. All right, so we understand that. He says, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires the new wine, for he says the old is better. In other words, sometimes, and this is what we see happening to people, they come here, they come out of, out of all that stuff, and then they go back somewhere and taste some sort of mixed, mostly kind of old wine with some new wine mix, and they think the old is better. All of a sudden, they, get, they, they miss the emotionalism of where they were. I mean, that's really more than anything else. They also miss this sort of... I know for some people it was depressing and frustrating thinking that life depended on them like saving people. Like people would die if they didn't go out there and, you know. But there are others that feel like that's the only way they have meaning in life is that they're supposed to go out there and save people. None of that's scriptural. Yeshua said he came. Oh, but Rabbi, at the end of Matthew, he sends out the 12. Yes, to go and find those that were lost and let them know their, their return has begun but not to go out there and try to save anybody. They went to some towns and didn't get received by anybody. Okay? It was the whomsoever wills. They felt no pressure to save anybody. They felt no, you know, I'm sure they felt sad when people didn't receive them, but they didn't feel like guilty, like, oh my gosh, these people are all gonna die now and burn in hell because of me. Because that's what you were taught. Of course, we all know and should know there is no burning hell like that for people who tortured in forever. There's a, there's a burning fire you're going to go in and be gone quick, and there's no coming back. That's also in John 15, by the way, where it says that those that do not stay in him are like the little stubble that goes in the fire and poof, it's gone. I think that's pretty clear, too. I don't know why people miss that. All right. So you, when you are working now on fixing your breach of your relationship, of your covenant relationship. Recognize that some of your struggles are because you're trying to put new wine in an old wine skin. So what does that look like in your life? You're still acting like the old you in too many ways. You have information that's new. That's the new wine. The old wine goes, sounds like this. Rabbi, I don't... Uh. See, that's the old wine. <laughs> the new wine you have to drink, partake of. The old wine is complaining, whining. I was like, no, I'm kidding. Well, it probably is some of that. I can't do this. It's too hard. La, la, la. All right. Don't do all of that. You struggle because the old Jew is still part of the mix. The old Jew, listen, I'm going to say this real clearly. He wanted you to bury the old person, the old Jew, for this reason. The old Jew cannot do this. I'm going to say that again. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that. I mean, I'm sure they couldn't. But I'm just, I want to be straight, forward, right? I'm looking right at the camera for everybody. Okay? The old you cannot do this. Only the new you can do this. Because the old you is going to love the old wine. The old you wants to do the old thing. The old you does not want to do this. So that old you has to be buried. So you're trying to do kind of half and half, it doesn't work. You can't do it. It won't work. That old you cannot do this. Oh, it can play at it for a while, just like an old wineskin until it bursts. I mean, you can put the patch on your garment, but everybody's going to know it's a patch. Instead of you, you know what? When you read in Revelation, it said that the bride has made herself ready and she's you know, clothed in is it a patchwork sort of garment? <laughs> no. So you, you have to fix this. And you have to recognize that you cannot do this if you're still the old you. 
Any part of the old Jew is not only going to struggle with this, it's going to try to drag you back there because it's going to say the old wine is better. It's going to try to convince you the old wine is better. All right? And I can tell you, when you guys come in whining, new or old, we don't want to hear it. There's, because it's, it's just you not wanting to deal with whatever your reality is. If you, have an, if you have a struggle, come with your struggle. Don't whine about it. Okay? I mean, look, I'm going to teach all of you how to be red, at least in one little way. Okay? When we did the color code thing and the personality thing. All right? Repeat after me. It is what it is. All right, again. It is? Embrace that and life will get a lot better. Because if it is what it is, there's no reason to complain about it. Because it just is what it is. By the way, that doesn't mean it can't change. I'm not saying it is what it is. It is what it is is what it is right now. Now, maybe it's changeable, maybe it's not. But you at least have to accept that for right now, this is the reality I'm in. So a lot of you wonder, why don't I get upset about this? Or why don't I worry about that? Because I accept as my mantra, it is what it is. Oh, but Rabbi, I'll lose my sister and brother over this. Well, it is what it is. What, I mean, it's not what you want, but it is what it is. You guys need to embrace that. It will help you so much if you could just own that. Okay, I promise you. All right, let's see. So he said, I'm going to paraphrase that whole section there. He's going to say, um, what he said was, I have not come to call the righteous those in good relationship, but sinners, those in breached relationship, to repentance, relationship, restoration. I'll say that again. I've not come to call the righteous. I'm like, I'm doing this so that you guys can write it down, knowing full well you can watch this back, pause it, and why. Anyway. I have not come to call the righteous those in good relationship, right? That's what the righteous are. But sinners, those in breach relationship, to repentance, relationship restoration. Hopefully we kind of can start to really get this. All right, now, let's go and really define things by going to 1 John 3 with that sort of foundation there. Okay, this is where we're going to get our, our definition of sin. And so a whole lot more. We're going to read most of chapter 3 here. All of it, actually. All right. So, we know in verse 4, I'll read the kind of key verse there, and then we'll go and explain some things. All right? He says, everyone doing sin. In other words, everyone what? Breaching relationship, covenant relationship. He says, everyone breaching covenant relationship is also doing lawlessness. So he's trying to tell you, the law is what defines it's the easy marker to see if you're in breach or not. Oh, no, Rabbi, it was done away with and nailed to the cross and la, la, la. Look, literally, it was nailed to the cross. Yeshua was the Lord. He was nailed to the cross. Didn't do away with anything. Or the stake or whatever. You know, it wasn't a cross. This, I'm saying, you don't understand what I'm saying, okay? Nothing was done away with. Was Yeshua done away with? No, he's sitting at the right hand. Now, so let's start in verse 1. We're in chapter 3 of 1 John. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of Elohim. How, are we talking to people in breach or people that are in relationship? In relationship. Okay. For this reason, the world does not know us, which means that the world doesn't understand us, doesn't have a relationship with us, because it didn't know him. How can you know me because I walk like him if you don't have a relationship with him? Because you had a relationship with him, you would see him in what I'm doing. You'd understand what I'm doing. Okay? So bear in mind, when this, I think this is a really, this is like group therapy right now, okay? Group counseling. When your family members, your friends, your coworkers are giving you grief about your walk, it's not because of you. It's because they don't know him. Okay? If they knew him, they would recognize you being him. That's the difference. That's the key. He says, for this reason, the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Beloved ones, now we are children of Elohim and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, by the way, when he says, see what love the Father has, beloved ones, John is so blue in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> He's just all... 
intimacy and relationship and all that good stuff. All right? All right, so he's saying, look, yes, we are children of Elohim. He said, but it's not yet been revealed what we shall be. In other words, what's the end of all this? Where does this lead to? Well, it leads to us becoming him. What does that look like? We're human beings. We don't understand what that is. I've often said it's like an amoeba, right? A little one-celled, you know, thing, understanding what we are with all of our billions of cells or whatever we have. There's no way to understand that. That's, I think the gap is probably more than that even between that and us and us and him, but you know, it's gonna be that incredible. At least we have the capacity to try to understand him. The amoeba doesn't have any ability to understand us. So maybe the gap isn't quite that big, but it's that kind of a leap. So he's saying is, look, I, John, who lived with, was discipled by the Messiah himself, I don't get it fully. So all of you out there that think you figured it all out, chill out a little bit. You know, easy now, because even if you, what, are you smarter than John? John lived with him, was trained personally, okay? And he says, look, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. In other words, when he showed, when he revealed, meaning when he returns, we shall be like him, because that's the changing and the twinkling that we read about, okay, that Paul talks about. And so that, okay, that, he says, we shall be like him, and then we're going to see him as he is. That's when we can see him as he is, because we're going to be like him. You know, if an amoeba all of a sudden became a human being, it would get it. It was like, oh, I get it, all right? So when we become like him, and we get changed literally into that substance, then we'll get it. Well, listen now. He says, and everyone having this expectation in him has an altar call, just keeps walking it out, letting Yeshua do everything for you. <laughs> Cleanses himself as he, Yeshua, is clean. Cleanses himself. So what does cleansing mean? It means that you're gonna clean up all the stuff you shouldn't be doing that breaches relationship. But it also says, as he. Okay, as he. What did he do? What made him clean? He kept everything. And he kept it perfectly. So we make the effort to be Yeshua like we need to make the effort to do covenant, Exodus 19, and obey and keep everything that he said. Period. Okay, everything. He says, everyone breaching relationship is doing lawlessness, verse four. Everyone doing sin also does lawlessness because sin is lawlessness, okay? The law tells you if you do this, it breaches my relationship with you. If you don't do this, it breaches my relationship with you with the do's and the don'ts, the positive and the negative commands. He says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. Oh, I'm gonna take this so much further for you right now, okay? All right, he says, you know that he was manifested. When was he manifested? No, not before the foundation. When was he manifested, like for human beings? When, when, when he came and put on the flesh suit? No, how about, how about when he, the Torah was given? He was manifested at Sinai. Because it says he was manifested to take away your breach. Okay? See, the whole world was in breach because they had not understood what they were expected to do. So he was manifested. What's manifested? He was brought in, brought forth into availability so that people wouldn't breach. That'll take you back to Sinai. Wow. All right? Because he just told you that sin was lawlessness. Not lawlessness meaning the secular version of it or whatever country you live in. No, the Torah version of it. The Yahweh version of it. So he just told you it's lawlessness, and then he said, but so that lawlessness would not abound, so there wouldn't be lawlessness, he was manifested so you'd know what to do and what not to do. So now we're talking about Torah being brought. Actually, when was he really manifested? Let there be light. That's when he was manifested. Genesis 1. Because it was tohu and bohu. There was, there was chaos and confusion. Empty and void. And so he was manifested to bring order, structure into all of this. 
And if anything we can all agree, probably looking at the world today, it is getting less and less structured. Okay, which is why the end, whatever the end time government thing will look like is going to come into this total chaos and impose order. Because people are going to realize they need order. They're just going to get it from the wrong source. Okay. And so he was made manifest to take away your breach. See, people say to take away your sins, meaning to take away all the things you did. No to give you the way not to keep doing it. So you know, oh my gosh, I had no idea that eating pork was going to be a, pre- a breach of con. I didn't realize that Sunday wasn't the Sabbath. I didn't realize that there were holy days. I thought Christmas and Easter was good enough. I didn't know. So I was, all, I was always walking around in a state of breach. Well, some people say, well, but you weren't in covenant. It doesn't matter. I couldn't be in covenant in that breach. Okay, so maybe you didn't actually breach covenant because you never made one. But you couldn't make one while doing those things. You had to be told, this is what covenant looks like. Okay? And so that's what you're getting shown. Oh, but Rabbi, they weren't shown that first when they covenanted in Exodus 19, but they already were in a relationship with him. A proper relationship. In other words, they knew exactly who they were dealing with. You were not told that or taught that or shown that properly in church. You were not shown him correctly. You're not showing what a relationship with him was look like correctly. So your problem wasn't about knowing that he exists. You already had that. You had some sort of relationship with the idea you had about what the creator was all about. Now you needed the manifestation of the Torah into that mess to give you an understanding of how to be in covenant and not in breach. Because you th- all of you felt like you were close to him at some point when you weren't. But you thought you were. And now he, he, he popped your bubble to show you because you wanted it so bad and because you, your timing was right, how to have that. This is how you have a relationship with me. If you love me, you keep my commandments. It's so simple. All right, now, he says, and you know that he was brought, in, brought forth, he was manifested to take away our breach, our sins, and in him, the Torah the truth, the light, Messiah, there is no breach. There's no sin. You see when you start filling it in a little bit more fully what that looks like? Now, verse 6, everyone staying in him, the light, the truth, the Torah, etc., those people, it says, do not sin. So people say, oh, I'm a Messiah, so I don't sin. No. It says if you're staying in him, you're not sinning because sinning is breaching. And to breach, you have to leave. You have to climb out of the hand. Jump out, fly out, whatever you do. Okay? He says, everyone staying in him does not sin. Everyone sinning has neither seen him nor known him. In other words, he's saying basically, everybody who sins doesn't get it. They just didn't get it. You didn't see, receive. You didn't, right? Revelation, we talk about, not the book, right? Something's revealed to you. You've heard me say this a lot lately. If you don't receive it, it's of no use. He's saying, he was revealed to you, made manifest, but you didn't receive it. He said, so you really didn't know him because you really didn't see or receive. That's the metaphor he's using or the phrase he's using. But that's the point he's making. He says, everyone who is sinning is demonstrating you didn't get it. And by the way, I have a bunch of people I know that have been through my teachings anyway and are out there back doing other things. They didn't get it. They didn't receive it. They heard it. They claimed they heard, they understood it, but they didn't. How do I know? This is the walk. You see the fruit. He says, little children, let no one lead you astray. The one doing Torah observance, doing righteousness. Well, Rabbi, why do you keep saying righteousness is Torah observance? Because that's literally what it means. It means doing what's right, according to Yahweh, not doing it right any which way you want. And the only thing in Scripture that tells you what that is is Torah. So you can't can't argue with me on that one. Well, you can try. It'd be pointless, okay? The the one doing right is righteous, even as he, the Torah, of course, if you do him, the Torah, the living light, the truth, because he's righteous, even as he is righteous. So if you're doing what he is and what he did and what he does, then you would be what he is. Do as I do and you'll be what I am. That's basically what he said. 
He says the one doing, the, doing sin is of the adversary. The one doing things that breach relationship is of the adversary. Because what's the adversary want you to do? Breach relationship. Starts in the garden. Did Yahweh really say? I think maybe you should breach. Go ahead and eat of that tree. He says, the one doing sin is of, and I'd rather say the adversary, because when you say, again, this is Christianese, the word devil is no good anymore. You can't even use it. I'm not telling you not to. It just, it evokes what it evokes, and you can't get away from it. All right? When he said to Peter, get behind me, Hasatan, he wasn't literally saying that Peter is now possessed by the devil. He was acting in an adversarial way. Because Hasatan in Hebrew simply means the adversary. The adversary, okay? So he says the one who is breaching, the one who's doing sin, is doing things of that mindset, that spirit of the adversary. Is acting in enmity to me, is an enemy. He says, because the adversary has sinned, has breached. Don't we know that that's what happened? He was like this wonderful, beautiful thing, and then he breached. He, he went against the relationship, expectations of the creator. He said, he said, the adversary sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of Elohim was manifested to destroy the works of the adversary. Well, how did this happen? How did he, how was he manifested to destroy the works? Well, let's see, the world was just doing every stupid thing they wanted to do and it brought a flood. Then they started doing it all over again. Now, yeah, we said, I'm not gonna flood the world again. But at some point, you all ended up in slavery and all kinds of other dumb stuff is happening and then I'm gonna take you out of there and I'm gonna hand you the law. I passed it down through word of mouth, trained a few people, let them train other people. Didn't seem to go over. I'm going to take a whole bunch of you as you grew into a giant nation, and I'm going to give you a whole thing in writing. So nobody can claim they didn't understand this, that, and I'm going to give you the whole thing. And, all, and what's the purpose? To destroy any adversarial relationship. Because covenant says, everything you say to do, I'll do. You can't do that in an adversarial relationship. So again, this is, this is where they want to pit Messiah and the devil in like a cage match or something, okay? I mean, it, it's just not the picture we should have. The devil is, or the adversary is, a mindset that we are going to be of the me, not you. I want, I like, that's the adversary. Anytime you get into the me, 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 you're an adversary to him. It should all be you, 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 okay? What do you want? How do you want this? And I'm not talking about the little, I'm saying is the things that Yahweh put in Torah. Yahweh talked about how we eat, then we should want it to be his way. Talks about days we keep, then it should be his way. Talks about how we treat each other in relationships, then it should be his way. Talks about our sexual relationships, should be his way. I'm not talking about what we're doing, but who we're doing it with. I'm, I'm serious, okay? I mean, all these things, it's gotta be, if he covered it, then we should be doing it his way. Anything else is adversarial because it was that pride that brought Lucifer down, right? It was the pride which created an adversary relationship because there's not room enough for both of us right here, right? If my pride is all huge, there's no room for me and you. But if you're humble, there's room for him and you because it's all about him, not you. That's why he has to humble you first, Deuteronomy 8 too. He humbled them. And then he tested them to see where their heart was at, whether it was there to keep the commands or not. Okay, we gotta be humble. So let's be more clear again. I know your church didn't teach it this way. Oh, you know, the Messiah came up and he just beat the snot out of the devil and now we're all good. That's what it seems like, doesn't it? And by the way, you also feel guilty, the church says, because it's the fourth quarter, we're in the last two minutes and we're losing. So get out there and save some people. I, the first, I, I'm, I'm being honest here. The first time I ever saw a televangelist, and that was kind of the stuff that was going on from that televangelist, this is like 50 years ago, I really felt like this doesn't make any sense because I feel like they think God's losing. Seriously. And I, I'm like, how is that possible? And he needs me or he's going to lose? That, yeah, someone just said he's screwed. Yeah. It's over, okay? 
let me promise you something. He doesn't lose. Victory is his, right? Now, he's going to have a victory. You may or may not have one yourself, too. Because don't get caught up in a, yes, victory. No, don't claim something. I didn't say that was for you. You only choose that to be you if you covenant. And then you stay in him. And then you allow that to put the works of the adversary off. Okay, destroy that. That's where you need to be. Pay attention. All right? Look, I know some of you are starting to realize that year after year, this is getting stronger and stronger. Simpler and simpler, which is funny how it could be simpler and stronger. But it's simpler and simpler. But that's what you've got to pay attention to. This is the purpose why the Son of Elohim was made manifest in Genesis 1, okay? In Exodus 19, or actually earlier on in Exodus with the plagues, okay? At Sinai in Exodus 19, in John 1, when he put on flesh, he was manifested because only through him can we have a relationship properly. No one comes to the Father except through him. Period. Through what? Oh, because I just believe in him. No, through Torah observance. Through uh, to embracing him as Messiah, delivering you, redeeming you really more than even delivering, right? Delivering you out of sin, so he tells you. So, so here's his two aspects of what he does. He redeemed you because he died. He delivered you because he lives. Because it's the Torah part, the teachings and instructions that deliver you out of the adversarial relationship. Because, I mean, after all, you breach relationship because of the adversarial thing. You want to do these things, and you shouldn't do them. Now, now, granted, a lot of it was stuff you didn't know you shouldn't do, up to a point. But once you know, now it's in your, now it's in your uh, ledger as to which way you go with that. It's either going to go as a yes or a no, right? A good or a bad. Okay, That's, it's now you're accountable. So there's an accounting. Because you're aware of it now. Okay, so this is the purpose he was made manifest, to destroy the works, not to destroy the devil, by the way. He says to destroy the works of the devil. So what are the works of the devil? Paul talks about this all over the place. I, I do what I don't want to do, what I want to do I don't do, and all this other stuff. Okay? He understands when he talks about this law raging in his members, the law of sin and death is not Torah. It's what seems right to a man. Because the way that seems right to a man leads to death. You see, it's all, it's consistent all the way through from cover to cover. It's all there. All right? All you needed was somebody to put it together for you. Now, when I say put it together, we're connecting the verses together, not me just speaking to you. I mean, I mean you're seeing the verses and how they connect. And by the way, some people, they get online and they ask like in the zone meetings and stuff like that, well, how do we know somebody's qualified to be a rabbi, qualified for this or qualified for that? I said, well, first of all, if that person, you ask them, well, who trained you? Because maybe they were trained by someone who's anointed. An anointed appointed then trains the next anointed appointed. Anybody that I label, you know I labeled them. I vetted them. I have the confidence that they have that gift and talent and that anointing. Now, what if the person doesn't have a teacher like me? Well, you know, at some point, there wasn't anybody to teach certain people. I mean, there has to be a starting point. So now what do you do? Are you just out of luck? No. You listen and you say, have I ever heard anybody talk like this? Have I, has anybody ever made this complex stuff so simple? Even when I thought simple, even more simple. Straighten up all the confusions. Reset all of the things that were misaligned. Those are the kinds of things you're looking for. When they speak, do you hear a different authority? That's not them, but maybe from above? This is not me trying to make an argument for myself. Although, you know what? Paul makes an argument for himself in many of his letters. And he, sa and he says, why do, I, why do I keep needing to do this with you guys? And this is, this is the appeal. Okay, I would have, when well, I started this journey, let's see, 1986. So that's a long time ago, all right? So it's going on 40 years. And I didn't have a teacher to do what I'm doing now. I would have just... I just would have been ecstatic. I mean, it just would have been amazing to have somebody to teach what I've put down for the last 700 teachings you have, okay? Because it's all so simple then. It's not this, oh, it's so hard, it's so complicated, so this. No, it's written in ways that would require a teacher. 
It was never meant, and I always say this in enough teachings because it needs to be said so people here didn't hear the other teachings. I don't want to insult you. This was never, the scriptures, right? Your Bible was never meant to be completely understood by you without help. I said completely. It was definitely meant to be understood to some degree without help, but it was never meant to be understood without help because for the structure to work and the guidance to be there, you need to have a need. If you can figure it all out yourself, why would there be a need for a structure? Oh, but we have the Ruach now. And how's that working for you? I'm serious. I mean, do you have all your answers? No. Every time I open up the floor for questions, there's always a long line of people asking questions. Because that's not the way the, the Spirit works. Okay? So let's just understand that. And I'm only saying that because I'm impressed with what I've said today, because I've never said most of these things before and putting it together. He's just giving it to me as I'm saying it. All these little nuances, all I have in my notes is to read the verses. I'm just going to read 1 John 3, the whole chapter. That was my, that was my notes. Knowing that I would pause wherever he wanted me to give me some sort of clarification. I wish you guys could be more impressed with that. Not me. With him. So then you'd receive the words better. I don't care if you receive me at all. Receive the words better. Now, he says, verse 9. Now, he just made this humongous thing about what Yeshua was manifest to do. He says, listen, everyone having been born of Elohim does not sin, doesn't breach relationship, because his seed stays in him and he is powerless to sin because he has been born of Elohim. That is a mess. Let me fix it, okay? He's saying, everyone who's been born of Elohim, you should not sin because you're of Elohim now. You, you, don't, you wouldn't sin. If you're born of him, you're not going to sin. And the reason that you wouldn't sin is because his seed is staying in you. And when his seed stays in you, you are powerless to sin. However, you should understand that if you don't stay in him, then you're outside of all this. You've now breached and you can sin. Don't confuse this. Remember, this is the same John that gave you John 15, okay? Where he says, stay in me. But then he says, those who don't stay in me have a problem. Let's be careful with that because he wants you to know. I don't want you to think, oh, I'm born again, so I can't sin. Nonsense. If his seed stays in you, which means, what's his seed? The word, the Torah. If it's active in you, you don't sin. The power of sin loses its power. However, you can still choose to do those things by your choice. Did that make that verse more clear? Okay? Because otherwise it reads very strangely. It says, because his seed stays in him, so he's powerless to sin because he's been born of all. So you can't sin anymore. The gentleman I mentioned a few teachings ago that was attacking me about the Are You Saved teaching, he literally teaches that if you're a believer, you can't sin. He has a teaching on his side. I don't know if he ever took it down, but that was from a long time ago. No, you can sin, and you do on a regular basis. Why? Because you didn't let his seed stay in you. You let the adversarial voice come into you, which matched up very nicely with your voice, because the adversary is simply a cheerleader for what you want. Oh, but Rabbi, I don't want to do this stuff. Yes, you do. On some level, you do. You wouldn't do it. Don't tell me every sin you do is something you really loathe and hate and you would really have no interest in. No. You may loathe and hate it, but you still want to do it. I mean, most of these things are not anybody. Nobody's twisting your arm to do them. They're things you want to do. Okay. Verse 10. In this, the children of Elohim and the children of the devil are manifest. Ah, now he's going to clarify it. Watch. He says, everyone not doing Torah is not of Elohim, neither the one not loving his brother. Ah, so we see that, okay? So on the one side, everyone who is not doing righteousness, not doing Torah, is not of Elohim. So that means that whenever you breach, you're no longer of Elohim. You've separated yourself from him. Now, that's why we repent, to fix that. He says, neither one not loving his brother, because a lot of the commandments are about how we love each other. He says, because this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was the wicked one and killed his brother, who was of the wicked one and killed his brother. Now, why did he kill him, he says, and why did he kill him? Because his works were wicked, but those of his brothers were righteous. Hmm. 
All we read about is an offering. We don't get anything else about their lives. Just one offering that they each made, and one was done correctly, the other was not. There's not a single Torah verse that shows you that they were instructed on how to do it, but when Elohim says to Cain, well, if you do it correctly, won't it go well with you also? Clearly the understanding is that he knew. He had been shown and trained and knew and chose not to. So don't just go with everything that's written in the scriptures. Go with what is also hinted at is already there. Okay? Elohim says, I am righteous. I am fair. Okay? Or I judge with fairness. There's equity and all this type of stuff. So he's not going to be very unfair and get mad at Cain for something nobody ever taught him. Just because we don't see it happening doesn't mean it didn't happen. It must have happened. Okay? Now, he says... I forgot where I was at. Okay, here we go. He says, do not marvel, my brothers, that the world hates you. All right? He says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. The one not loving his brother stays in death. Okay, so what, what brings death? To sin or breach of covenant, right? Penalty of sin is death. So what he's saying is, we know that we've passed out of death into life because we love, according to Torah, the brothers. We love the brothers as instructed from above because that moves us out of death into life. Because death is breach, life is keep. Right? You keep the commandments, you do things in the right relationship, you, love the, you do two great commandments, you love Elohim with all your heart, mind, soul, being, etc., and you love your neighbor as yourself. But you do them the way Yahweh said to do it. Not just any which way you want to do it. Okay? And that's how you move from death to life. It's the same, same thing over and over again. Let's continue. And he says, everyone hating his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has everlasting life staying in him. Okay, so there's an interesting little part of this phrase here. So he says, okay, everyone hating his brother is a murderer. In other words, you hate your brother, you really, basically, it's like you want him dead. And by the way, didn't Yeshua basically say, you know where it says don't commit murder and you hate your brother? Like that was one of the first things he taught on. Okay? That was one of the very first things he taught on. So John remembers that. So he's saying, look, hating your brother is like murder. Why? Because Yeshua told us that. So we know that. But look at this. He says, and you know that no murderer has everlasting life staying in him. You can lose everlasting life. In other words, everlasting life is at the end. It's a reward. So people think they have it. So he's saying you have a potential for it, but if you decide to go be a murderer, you lose that potential. Unless, of course, you repent and restore and all the things that are necessary. Okay? Pay attention. He says, the murderers, you know. He says, you know this. You know that a murderer does not have everlasting life staying in him, residing in him as a potential there wasn't any eternal beings at the time that John's talking. So he must be talking about the potentiality of it, that they could have this. But guess what? You commit murder, you don't get to keep it. So that proves that verse 9 can't mean what the churches have taught. This idea that you're powerless to sin and you can't sin. Because you can't when you don't stay in him. Okay? So let's just keep that in mind. He says, by this we know love. We have known love because he laid down his life for us. And now we're in uh, verse 16. By this we have known love because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our, for our brothers. He says, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his tender affections from him, does the love of Elohim stay in him? This is kind of like what James 2 is all about, right? About understanding that I show you my belief by my actions. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Ah, let's not love just by talking the talk. You got to walk the walk. So in deed and in truth. Well, what do you know is the truth? Yeshua is the truth. The Torah is the truth. He says, let's do it in Torah. He says, I lost my place. Okay, verse 19. And by this we know that we are of the truth, and shall set our hearts at rest before him, that if our heart condemns us, Elohim is greater than our heart and knows all. This is for all of you, somewhat, somewhat depressed 
people specifically about this one issue who just don't believe you're worthy that you can get there because of all the things you did. This is your heart condemning you. And he said, no, if you're doing all of these things, that's the old you should be dead. Okay, it's an old wineskin. So don't worry about your heart. This is not about, well, my heart versus the Torah. No, this is my heart from the old me doesn't think I'm worthy or qualified for this. So your heart's condemning you. He says, so if your heart condemns you, Elohim is greater than your heart and knows all. Oh, see, so he's saying he knows the truth now, even though it's not the same as what it was then. But now you are a child of the living Elohim. Then you were a mess. But you're thinking, but I was such a mess. How could he possibly love me? I have conversations with people about this every single week. He says, because he's greater than your heart. Because you don't feel like he could love you doesn't mean he can't love you. He's greater than that. So this is not the heart versus commands, which isn't that what the church teaches here? Okay. He says, beloved ones, if our heart does not condemn us, we have boldness towards Elohim. In other words, if your heart hasn't already screwed you up and condemned you and judged you, then we can have boldness to let Elohim do what he needs to do and trust that Elohim has put us on a path that's correct that leads to your everlasting life. Now, let's be careful what he says next, which really kind of makes it really clear. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we guard his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. So he's saying, we're guarding his commands, we're doing what's pleasing in his sight, so stop listening to the, that, that depressed voice in your head that says you're a loser and a piece of garbage and you've done all these horrible things, so you can't possibly be in there. Own this. Some of you, that's you. Let it go. Release that, set that whole thing, bury it, okay? He said, you need to say, understand that whatever we ask, we receive from him because... Now, by the way, let me just rephrase that probably the way it reads. Whatever we ask that we receive from him, not whatever we ask, we receive whatever we ask, because you know, he's not your genie that you rub the bottle, does what you want. You know, he says that whatever you ask and he gives it to you, the reason he's giving it to you is because you're guarding his commands and doing what's pleasing in his sight. Does that make more sense? Simple translation adjustments. Because the other way doesn't make any sense. Because you can ask for all, how many of you have asked for a whole bunch of things he's never given you? Ta-da, okay? So it, it just doesn't work that way. But know that when he gives you what you ask, it's because you're making the effort to keep and do what's well-pleasing in his sight. In his sight, not your sight, not your sister's sight, your mother, your father, everybody else. It's not mine even, his sight. You gotta do what's right in his sight, period. And this is his command that we should believe in the authority of his son, Yeshua Messiah, and love one another as he commanded us. Now, believing the authority reads so much better than name because the authority is the light that came in Genesis 1, the Torah that came in Exodus 19, the one they put on the, the flesh suit in John 1. Okay, the authority that that being has. And then what was made manifest to us was how to become that. He said, this is the command that we should believe in that. The Torah, the Messiah, the light, the truth, all of it, believe in its power if you take and use and apply. Not the power to do it for you, to you, or whatever. But do, do you believe that he is the way? Yes, okay, then walk in that way. Do you believe that he's the truth? Good, then embrace that truth, that's the Torah. Do you believe that doing that will lead to life? Yes, because he is life. So if you embrace him, Torah, truth, and the path, then yes, you will have life. But do you believe it? Some of you don't believe it because you, you, you're just still beating yourselves up. That's what this is all about. I'm sure John was talking to some bunch of people, just said, oh, you have no idea what I've done in my life. Oh, you have no idea this. Oh, yeah. What do you mean? I've no the, the creator knows everything you did. He even knows everything you will do. And by the way, not because he's like, seeing into the future, because time doesn't work the same when you're not in time. He's outside of time. So he's already seen you do it, you just haven't done it yet, but he's seen you do it, so he knows what you're gonna do because you already done it. Oh, I didn't do it yet, right? Yeah, well you have, we're just, we happen to go through time straight through, he doesn't. He could jump anywhere he wants in time and see what's going on. Because he could see how it all plays out. I know it doesn't make sense because we're amoebas, okay? <laughs> all right. <laughs> 
All right, so he says, and this is the command that we should we believe in the authority of his son, Messiah Yeshua, in your life, okay? And because you believe in that, you love one another as he gave his command. And the one guarding his commands stays in him. This is how you stay in him. And he in you, etc. And by this we know that he stays in us by the Ruach which he gave us. And the Ruach that he gave us should be that we are walking in the fruit of Galatians 5 and that we are being filled with his intrinsic nature. Okay? By the intrinsic nature. Are you becoming Yeshua-like? Are you letting, as Paul said, this mind be in you, Philippians 2, 5? All right? Are we becoming like him? That's the key here. All right? That's what we need to understand. Okay? Now, I'm hoping that's just, be, I mean, we're just getting started here, but let me just kind of see what else I wrote in my notes here. So lawless from, lawlessness from the Greek is anomian, which means lawlessness, iniquity, disobedience. Verse four, let's just go back to it again. Everyone doing sin also does lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. I'm going to rephrase that. Everyone doing things, everyone doing things that are sin or missing the mark breaches the relationship with Elohim through disobedience to the law. Sin is disobedience to the law. Does that make it much clearer now? Everyone doing things that are sin. In other words, they miss the mark, breach the relationship with Elohim as set forth in covenant through disobedience to the law, which is the basis of the covenant. Sin is disobedience of the law. Okay? The Torah instructs us in Yahweh's exp- uh, as to what Yahweh's expectations are of his relationship with us. Okay? When we are disobedient to the Torah, we breach that relationship as expressed in Sinai. I'm hoping that you're starting to get this. Okay, I was looking forward to the sin teaching. Hopefully you're also now understanding why I did some of the other ones first to show you how we have terms that are a little off. Okay, that we're just not getting the terms correctly. And I know it's hard to read these letters because the Ruach isn't going to do it for you. Well, that's not true. Ruach does it for you, but through my mouth. In this case, not like universally. You understand what I'm saying? That's the Ruach speaks through someone. Abba talks through somebody. That's the anointed appointments Paul's talking about. Okay, the prophets, the teachers, specifically those of the fivefold. Your prophets and your teachers. And your apostles, even. Although the apostles are mostly setting up the, you know, the congregations. So that, that being said, I'm going to pray. Father, we come before you. And Father, we, we're, we really so much want to be doing what's pleasing in your sight. We really want to embrace and recognize and submit to and believe in the authority of the fullness that is your son, Yeshua, that he is the light, that he is truth, that he is the Torah, that he is the way, that he is life. And that, Father, that we would stay in you, that we would stay in you and cling and cleave and hold fast so that we can actually have the everlasting life that you birthed in us when you called us. You made that possible for us and gave us an understanding that that possibility was now there. We also understand that we can breach relationship and not have that. So Father, help us and encourage us to truly commit to have the discipline to stay in relationship and not breach that relationship. And that if we ever breach it, to as quickly as is possible to make the repentance move to restore, to restore the breach. So Father, we want to thank you We want to praise you, and we want to just appreciate you with everything we have and love you in the name of all names, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Amen.